Welcome to our Chemical Science. I'm Jordan, an open source researcher who investigates science that's generally very old, very new, or very esoteric. Alright, uh, so you may remember this image behind me uh, from the controversial episode of the Joe Rogan Experience with Randall Carlson, and it's called the Plasmoid Unification Model, uh, the brainchild of Malcolm Bendel and drawn up for him by Steve Earle. And it's one of the most curious and mind-stretching diagrams that I've ever laid eyes on. I've been warned by Malcolm that this might send me bald like him, um, but despite this ominous foretelling, uh, in this video series we're going to attempt to decipher this thing, at least a little bit. So in part one of this series, we're just going to take a quick lay of the land and discuss some of the important precursory ideas, uh, like the ether, or unified field, and the alternative form of mathematics Malcolm has used to construct the PUM. So what is the PUM, and why is it relevant and important? So the plasmoid unification model shows how ether, sound, elements, planets, precession of time, and everything else you can see here on the poster, um, which we'll look more deeply into soon, how they algorithmically relate to each other. And it gives us the base theory behind Malcolm's new inventions and shows how energy at rest can be converted to matter and imprinted with a specific time or frequency. So as we all probably know by now, uh, pre-1900s and for a little while afterwards, a majority of important physicists such as Nikola Tesla, Max Planck, Isaac Newton, Oliver Heaviside, the whole gang, um, there's plenty more of them, they based their discoveries on the idea that there was a unified field of energy uh, from which all matter came, a subtle medium, uh, energy at rest, so without frequency, time, or spatial dimensions. And this is the ether. And the ether's pretty much been written out of textbook physics uh, since that time, and it's resulted in modern physics becoming more and more abstract and theoretical until today, where we're faced with a dead end that we probably should have recognized decades ago. Our current models do not sufficiently explain things like dark matter or action at a distance or black holes, and some of the most important equations and models that are now being taught contain completely arbitrary numbers to make them work. And this is true, and it doesn't need to be the case. You know, it means perhaps there is another model out there. Um, but in recent decades, we're seeing the ether being returned to its rightful place at the center of our scientific thought. And some modern researchers like Marco Roden, Randall Carlson, Ken Wheeler, and many others um, have been promoting this return to genuine science for some time already, beginning to build a new picture of the lost ancient sciences with their respective discoveries in mathematics, magnetism, geology, field theory, etc. And Malcolm Bendel is cut from the same mold. He's not teaching conventional physics and chemistry, he's propounding a new model completely. And people don't usually like this, I get it. They scream bloody arrogance at anyone who doesn't seek to meet the criteria of current academic opinion. But let's get this straight, writing the ether, the unified field, out of science is true arrogance. This is true arrogance. Writing it back in is paying respect to the honest scientists of the past and to the host of revolutionaries who've sometimes died trying to give us back the technology that has without a doubt been suppressed over and over again for the last 120 years. And so with that being said, this is where we can begin with the plasmoid unification model. So as we've discussed, there is a unified field of energy, um, the ether, from which the other more commonly known four states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma, originate from. And as you can see up here in the top left corner of the PUM, we can refer to energy in this state as DC, direct current, energy at rest. Essentially, it's just unlimited potential at this point, yet unformed by the mold of time. It's no frequency and all frequencies simultaneously. And Malcolm explains that when we have all frequencies, all matter combined, we also have no frequency, no matter. Like if we mix all of the paints of our color palette, we end up with gray, um, all colors, but also no color. Or if we paint a paper circle with different colors and then we make it spin, as children often do in school, we'll see the color disappear when it's spinning fast enough. And similarly, the unified field is just like this. It contains all information, all possible frequencies, but it's in a state where it's yet unmolded by time, like an endless ocean of water or air with no vessel to contain it. And then we come to our sun. So our sun is an ether to matter converter. In other words, it's a time imprinting device transforming ether, DC current at rest into matter, AC current with a frequency. 
And ether has the same structure as matter, however it's permanence at rest, whereas matter is permanence in motion. The sun is contained by, or more accurately, is a toroidal magnetic field, just like our Earth and all of the other stars, planets, and other entities like us. And like all toroidal magnetic fields, the magnetic field of the sun occurs simultaneously with its inverse hyperspatial poloidal field from the zero point. And the poloidal field and the zero point are also sometimes referred to by uh, the likes of Ken Wheeler and Charles Proteus Steinmetz as the hyperboloidal dielectric field and dielectric portal. And also the zero point is commonly referred to as a black hole um, in other circles. And we already know from our conventional understanding of black holes uh, that matter can be pulled into what we commonly refer to as the South Pole, otherwise known as the centripetally converging vortex or the uh, contracting vortex of the toroid, where the atomic bonds of the matter are then disassociated and the resulting components return to the state of ether, DC current or energy at rest in no time and no space. Inversely, uh, ether is again converted to matter and is ejected from the so-called North Pole, the centrifugally diverging or expanding vortex of the toroid. And so in the case of our sun, the time mold or the frequency which it's applying to the ejected matter is that of protium, our most fundamental particle designation, which is the most abundant isotope of the hydrogen group and the most abundant element in our universe. And it has a melting point or phase change point of minus 259.2 degrees Celsius and an elemental frequency of 25,920 cycles per second. So why this phase change point and frequency exactly? So 25,920 is what we call the great year frequency. And to break down what that means, uh, every 25,920 years, the sun, the moon, the earth, and the naked eye planets arrive at exactly the same points they were at 25,920 years ago. And so the great year frequency could perhaps be considered the true metronome or the base frequency of our universe. But we'll get back to that soon. And you can always go and check out Randall Carlson's lectures on this as he's been the one to really propagate this idea in modern times. So protium's frequency is set by the great year frequency. And where does the sun come in then? So let's start to think about Plato's music of the spheres. The sun has a diameter of 864,000 miles. If we divide minus 259.2, which is the phase change point of protium or hydrogen, by three, uh, we get minus 86.4. We have minus 86.4, and then the diameter of the sun is 864,000. And so this is where we need to stop and um, talk about something else before we carry on. So in modern conventional mathematics, uh, minus 86.4 and 864,000 share little relevance with each other, except for the similarity of the individual digits that they contain. And in, in alternative systems of mathematics, uh, such as Marco Rodin's vortex-based maths um, and Malcolm Bendel's alien maths, or Sanskrit maths, which we're about to talk about, each of the digits can also be considered individually. So their sequence within the whole number simply refers to the dimension that the digits currently occupy, and the zeros simply indicate the level of amplification. So Malcolm gives an example that if we look at the numbers 864, 846, 684, 648, 486, and 468, it really doesn't matter what sequence they're in, if we multiply them or we add them together, we will always end up with the same numbers. And in this case, if we add any of the above digit sequences together, the sum will be 18. And if we multiply any of the digit sequences together, we get 192. And this is what's important here, rather than the sequence of the digits themselves. Otherwise, in Sanskrit maths, we can consider these seemingly different sequences uh, fundamentally as the same number. And again, we might consider this a new idea in modern times, but it's actually a very old form of mathematics that was well known by all ancient cultures. And we can tell this for a fact by examining the structures such as the pyramids and temples and other buildings where we find the utilization of these same sequences of numbers again and again and again. For example, the angle of the slope of the casing of the Great Pyramid is 51.84 degrees, which is both a fraction of uh, 29,520 and if divided by two, equals 
25.92 degrees and correlates again with the phase change point of protium and the great year frequency. And I really appreciate the fact that Malcolm gives credit to the Vedic civilization of Bharat or India here by giving the term Sanskrit mathematics. Because if we look back in the history books of India, we can find many records um, of many important scientific concepts such as the Fibonacci spiral, Pythagoras' theorem, predating the Greeks by hundreds and even thousands of years. And it's really about time someone's giving them credit instead of just writing India out of colonial Western history altogether, which is the norm. At any rate, if we look at the melting point of protium divided by 3, minus 86.4, and the diameter of the sun, 864,000 miles, through the lens of Sanskrit mathematics, they represent the same number of frequency, just at different amplitudes. And so if we try and twist our minds into a toroid to try and understand what's going on here, um, we can see that it's not really a simple case of either the sun determining the frequency of protium or the great year, or of protium or the great year determining the resonant frequency or the dimensions of the sun. Rather, we can explain it most easily by saying that absolutely everything in our multiverse is always in perfect octave harmony with everything else. So let's provide some more evidence for this claim. If we take the diameters and the distances between each other of the sun, uh, the moon and the earth, the three most important celestial bodies of our galaxy, we will obtain some interesting numbers. So the diameter of the sun we know is 864,000 miles. The average distance between the sun and the earth is 93,312,000 miles, uh, which happens to be exactly 108 times uh, 864,000 miles, the diameter of the sun again. So similarly, if we take the diameter of the moon, 2,160 miles, and the average distance between the moon and the earth, 233,280 miles, we can see that the average distance between the moon and the earth is again exactly 108 times 2,160, the diameter of the moon. And then again, if we take the diameter of the moon again, and we create a square around the moon, and we find the sum of the four sides of the square, guess what we get? We get 8,640, which is the same number we get for the diameter of the sun. 864,000, but again, with less amplification. Another little fact from, uh, this one's from Randall Carlson. If we take the diameters of the moon and the earth, and we stack the two vertically together like so, and then we draw a circle around them, we can then draw a square around our inner earth circle like so, and we will find that by doing this, we have squared the outer circle that encases both the moon and the earth. So this means that the square we've drawn around the Earth and the circle surrounding the Earth and the Moon have the exact same area, which is just pretty cool. And you can try and claim this is all just random chance or number juggling if you like, but the evidence isn't particularly in your favour so far. There are two obvious things that all of this should probably tell us. So one, uh, our universe is of intelligent design and everything's operating in perfect harmonic resonance. And two, we really need to throw away the metric system and go back to using imperial measurements. Apparently the imperial system only seems ridiculous if you've learned a warped and deformed system of mathematics that's obsessed with ones and zeros. And as Marco Roden has been telling us for three decades, numbers are real and alive. Real mathematics isn't arbitrary and neither is the imperial measurement system apparently. Now I know this doesn't constitute evidence of intelligent design yet for real skeptics out there, but this is really only the tip of the proverbial harmonic iceberg here. So in this video we've just introduced the plasmoid unification model, explained why it's important. We've uh, introduced alien or Sanskrit maths, uh, which shares many similarities with Marco's VBM, of course, and we began to explore the relations between the Sun, Moon and the Earth. And in the next part of the series uh, we're going to break down the periphery areas around the outside of the PUM and explore more deeply how everything in the universe is in perfect octave harmonic resonance with itself. And we'll break down the numbers in each of the four tables given in the four corners, and we'll also take a much deeper dive into understanding how ether is converted into matter and imprinted with time or frequency. And we'll explore the importance of the number nine and some of the other sacred numbers too, and start to really attempt to show how all things in our universe have an algorithmic relationship to each other. 
And finally, in the third part, we will take a look into the diagram itself and investigate how we can use the plasmoid unification model to explore the relations between elements, music, time, seasons, degrees of the arc, language, and everything else you see here on the poster. And lastly, just in the spirit of transparency, I'm really no expert in any of this. Um, in my defense, there's only a handful of people in the world who are even trying to begin to understand this stuff. Um, and these videos are really just my university experience, because there is no normal university I can study at. And, and I find it's really the only way I can grasp complex topics like this, um, you know, just to force myself to break them down and try and teach them to other people. And that's why I do it. So if I get something wrong, tell me, I'll correct it. You know, this is part of the learning experience for me. On the other hand, um, you know, if you're just generally offended by the way I learn or conduct my own research, as the occasional commenter tells me they are, well, suck it up and piss off back to your hole in the ground, you know. This isn't meant for you, and I'm just going to keep going ahead and doing it the way I want to. Um, and to the rest of my lovely and supportive viewers, thanks for sharing the vision. Keep on learning and experimenting with an open heart and mind. We're building on something really great here, and as Malcolm's often said, we truly stand on the shoulders of giants, and I personally believe he is one of them. So like the video and subscribe to the channel to catch the next part in the series. Bye.